Thanks for coming back to the channel. In this video, we're taking an inside look at what it takes to put on the loudspeaker showcases and demos that Live Sound International and Pro Sound Web have been bringing to events around the country in recent years. From the USIT, United States Institute for Theater Technology Conference just this past week in Kentucky, to the WFX Worship Facilities Expo in Orlando, to the NAM show we took you to in Anaheim, California this past January, the Live Sound International team really have this dialed in. Today, we're talking with educator, Pro Sound Web author, and sound engineer Nicholas Redina. You can usually catch him side stage handling monitor duties for touring rock band OAR, as well as on his YouTube channel where he makes instructional pro audio videos on the road. Nicholas has been A1 for many of the speaker demos and showcases and is the perfect person to show us how it's done. Stick around, subscribe, and be sure to turn on the notifications if you'd like to hear more from Nicholas. We've got a longer episode in editing right now, talking with Nicholas about touring, technology, and career trajectory as a freelance audio professional. Look for that in the next few weeks here and on the DC Sound Up podcast, available on iTunes and in the Google Play Store. So welcome to the channel, Nicholas Redina. Hello, hello. So uh, remind me where you live. I'm in Washington, D.C. I was I was just there yesterday. Were you really? I was doing a gig with, uh, with OAR at uh, the Marriott downtown for the Leukemia Ball. So... What are we talking about? You're back home in Cincinnati? Yeah, for uh, two more days, and then I'll leave again. So I got home yesterday, and then I leave on Thursday. Is that uh, for, for another part of uh, another OAR um, day? No, this is actually a corporate. Um, so I work for a couple different corporate corporate companies actually out of the area, Cincinnati here in northern Kentucky. I, mean, I don't ever work for them in the city, but they do a lot of stuff outside of the city um so this is just a week-long corporate thing in south carolina they do it's some pretty large clients so you know we're in vegas a couple times a year doing the arena there and whatever the usual big ballroom corporate gigs so how did you uh how did you get into doing the uh this the showcases with uh with keith and the guys i know you've obviously written for pro sound web mm-hmm. for a number of years and you you uh i love your website the sound, sound nerd sound nerds and the the workshops and everything that you you've got going on all the videos are are excellent um how did you get involved in the uh the speaker showcase with them um i don't know how long ago it was maybe six years ago or so um There's a company here in Cincinnati called Event Enterprises, really great sound company. And there was a new festival in town called the Bunbury Music Festival, which is a very large festival here in the city. It's it's along our riverfront, multiple stages. And I worked for Event Enterprises that year because they were doing they were doing backline audio. And the owner of that company and I are really good friends and we've done a gazillion shows together. And Keith came to the festival to interview Grant because he's kind of an up and coming regional sound company. And Keith uh, interviewed me a little bit, took a couple photos, and then we never saw each other again. And then the USITT conference was happening actually in Cincinnati at our convention center. And Keith reached out to Grant needing an A1 for the gig and Grant recommended me so I did the gig, went great. Uh, Keith and I got along really, really well. And at the end of it all, um, I just mentioned to Keith, if you ever um, need additional writing to let me know. And that's when the writing thing happened. And, and he and I kind of developed this kind of Lone Ranger audio column where I talk about things that um, I wish I would have known 20 years ago. Fundamentals of live sound and things like that. Um, so then ever since then... I do as many of those as possible because we really have uh, all the manufacturers, for the most part, I've worked with before. And the learning curve is not nearly as as much as it was the first and second year of just trying to wrap our heads around the best way to manage all of that. I mean, it seems simple, but it's more complicated than it seems (laughs) for sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, But that's how it happened. And um, I haven't done all of them. I can't do all of them, but I've done definitely the lion's share of them over the last five or six years. Were you involved in the planning of that at all? Uh, You know, I'm not. I really don't know anything until I walk into the uh, venue. I mean, I know know how many manufacturers usually there are, and I know what the console I'm using and and the in and out and that kind of stuff, but all the stuff ahead of time, I don't know much about. 
And I think it's easier that way. Um, Cause in all honesty, I don't really need to be involved in the music side. I, I think the way it works is the magazine, you know, maybe uh, picks a certain amount of songs and then the manufacturers vote on them. And then the top, whatever are picked as the, as the songs for the, for the demo. And then Keith just before each demo, will just pick some songs and I'll cue them up and we fire them away. So I'm not really involved on that side of it. It really is, you know, the, the, the one, as soon as I get my feet in the ground at the venue is when I really start working the event, <laughs> but there's a lot ahead of time, but from a technical side, because we've done it so many times, we've been able to, kind of know where things need to be and what we need to bring. Now I got to take a look at the the setup there. Can you walk through just a little bit of the configuration of, of how you're just setting things up and what the signal flow is maybe to each one of those? What was it, 12 vendors this year? I think so, yeah. So, you know, for the listeners or the viewers, so just imagine like um, an arena or just a large room um, and maybe in like a horseshoe kind of or a U fashion there are 12 manufacturers, usually three or four on each side of the U um, with a PA in the air, like a small line array or compact line array in the air. And, or, and then there's a smaller speaker on a stick type sound system on the floor. So each manufacturer, there are two sends for them. So everyone gets a mono signal. Um, and it depends on the desks we're using, but the majority of the time we've, we use a, just the Yamaha world. Um, we've had Digico before um, and some of the manufacturers, but Yamaha seems to be a, a pretty steady partner for that. And it does make it easy. Um, so usually there'll be some sort of Yamaha console, either a QL1 or QL5 or um, a CL or something like that. And what I'm looking for is I need to have as many outputs as possible, buses as possible on the console. Um, and then usually we'll get a couple of Rio boxes, just some IO boxes that we will distribute on the corners of the rooms usually and that's kind of the hub of where everybody's outputs come from my outputs come from to their inputs so if you think about um like a a rio box there's 16 outputs on that analog outputs um and in years past we we had offered um you know an analog just a copper line we've offered um AES and we've offered Dante and as much as um, sometimes the Dante side could make it way easier it's it's proven to be a bit difficult um, just to try to um, have everybody configured correctly because sometimes someone might have a router in their system that might therefore reset IP addresses somewhere else because I'm you know they're just plugging into a switch somewhere arbitrarily I don't really know past that switch what's happening because they're also managing their demo like each manufacturer will get some time throughout the week to do their own thing um so technically we we just try to keep it as simple as possible and also just kind of level the the playing field i mean this is not a, a competition it's a showcase um but it is nice to have it all standardized that way when i'm troubleshooting I know with a cue box or something that at this output, I have signal or, you know, right before I plug into them, I know I have signal. And when I get into the Dante world, even the AES, but on, honestly, mainly Dante, it's it's difficult to troubleshoot quickly when I have, you know, 11 other manufacturers that are waiting to have their signal run. So, but in general, it's just a console and two two Rio boxes that distribute the signals. Um, I call them small and big in my world just to know what's what. Um, I just color code the outputs and label the outputs manufacturer name. And, and then on the console, I just take a, usually it's a Dante feed from a laptop, which is the music playback. And then we'll have a wireless mic or two for the MC. Um, and really that's the only inputs. Um, sure. And then we will... Uh, I'll just have a pink noise channel um, and I will turn that pink noise on and turn every, you know, an output on at once. And then we will pink noise. We, we will set a level SPL wise for each manufacturer and rational gets involved usually with that. And we'll put a, a measurement mic where it needs to be in the room and we'll 
kind of generally feel it out of what a good volume level is. And everybody, you know, because it's not a competition, all the manufacturers for the most part are, they know the deal. They know that, you know, they want to make sure there's enough impact and it's loud enough, but not too loud because you're listening to a lot of different systems and there's a chance for everyone to turn it up if they need to, but just trying to find a base level that makes sense. Um, and then I'll, you know, I'll turn that output off and turn the next output on and then um, pull the fader up to a point where it's registering the same and that's it. And we just go through, we will play 30 seconds of one song throughout everybody's system. And then we'll do the same thing again with the second song and then a third song. And then there might be a manufacturer's choice where they've given me a song. They, you know, they want to play this song as their choice to show off their system, how they want to show it off. But in a nutshell, that's it. You know, it's from a technical side, it's really not that complicated once you understand what you're trying to do. Um, you know, cabling is, is the hardest thing, you know, because you're, sure. you know, you've got basically 12 little eight by eight booths and most of their amplifiers and boxes and skids and stuff are right behind that drape. And that's where that cabling has to go past either. So, you know, kind of managing like when I can get in there, I might get in there the first thing before everyone's really set up, but it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to kind of manage cable management. But other than that, um, that's basically how things are done and it, and it goes pretty smoothly. This video is made possible in part by our good friends at Electro Sound Systems. If you want to see what goes on at a real working live sound shop, their YouTube channel is for you. In the shop, on the job, and on the workbench, they're taking you along for the fun at electrosoundsystems.com. I saw the Rational Acoustic guys. They had a screen up that had some SBL readings and things. Did they do anything else measurement-wise, or were they taking any other measurements or they, anything like that? They weren't. They were doing uh, some time captures of just, you know, so we had an idea over a period of time, SBL levels. Sure. There's some sort of reference there um, to make sure that, you know, because after three or four days of this, I mean, myself and everyone included, I mean, I wear earplugs the whole time just so I can manage getting through a day of, of loudness. <laughs> but so, we, you know, my perception of loudness and, and maybe Keith's perception or the other crew's perception is just a bit different because we've been in front of these speakers all day long and the people that are coming in are new manufacturers have been there all day long so having a just a little check time-wise like well this morning we were here and now we're here and are we okay with that so but other than that that's all they did um i believe it was I believe it was just a c weighted um i can't remember what the number was that we chose but uh, i'm pretty sure it was a c weighted response but that was it there was no phase response no, none of that was happening it was just me it was purely an spl um measurement Sure. Now you've sat through, I can't imagine how many hours of listening to these now. Um, do you have any advice for somebody that's never been to a speaker shootout before to like how to get something useful out of it? Yeah. Um, the, the, the best thing is, I, I think if I was coming to that is first of all, come in with no preconceptions. Like even if your favorite manufacturer is there, try to come in there with an open mind. Um, it really is a super unique event where you're able to you know, literally just standing in one place and turning a little bit, you can hear 12 manufacturers show off a very similar size and, and often a similar priced system. I mean, it, it's it's a bit, of, you know, it's there's definitely higher price and some lower price. But in general, everyone's we're kind of trying to find that middle ground of, of speaker systems. And if you go in there with a preconceived idea, like I love this manufacturer or this manufacturer, um, you may start thinking in this competition mind, like, well, the, you know, it's going to be louder. Or these these guys are going to be better because they're my they're my favorite manufacturer or whatever. And I think it's best if you want to really benefit, just have a completely open mind, because often the manufacturers are showing off some new stuff that you may you may have never heard before. Um, and I don't know. I mean, in my world, I do see a lot of different. Uh, sound systems. Granted, a lot of the stuff I see and hear are much bigger than maybe what they're showing off at these things, but it's still the same pedigree. And I think it's important to to get a chance to hear all that in that environment, because honestly, if you go to 
you know, guitar centers, you're not going to have a 12 compact line arrays hanging in a room and someone's allowing you to listen to the same song at the same SPL level throughout. So it's a very unique thing to do. So that would be my recommendation is to come in with an open mind and, and stop looking at speakers, just close your eyes and listen, <laughs> you know, cause there's a lot of, um, I mean, I, I'm sure I do it too. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, people looking up at the speaker and, you know, like, you know, twisting their head and kind of like, mm, yeah, yeah. All right. And like waiting for something to come out of the speaker. Guarantee you, I mean, as long as, you know, we keep the, the levels under control, then nothing's going to come out of those speakers. Um, so sometimes it's best to just kind of close your eyes and listen. And um, we try to keep the banter in between the systems as short as possible. So like your auditory memory is really just, it's not quite a perfect AB situation, but it's pretty close. You know, at least it's very revealing to hear how different manufacturers choose to voice their their sound system. Thanks again, Nicholas, for taking the time out to walk us through your workflow and how the team at Live Sound International put these awesome events together. I hope you'll all visit Nicholas's soundnerdsunite.org website and subscribe to him on YouTube. He's got some really cool videos. And don't forget to turn on the notifications here so you get the update when our longer interview with Nicholas is released in the coming weeks. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.